We are uh, continuing on into, this is week five of Theology Proper, and uh, Theology Proper looks at the person of, of God, the attributes of God, um, the way in which he uh, differs from us, but then also in the way in which he, he interacts with us, and that's, that's really what we're, we're looking at here uh, tonight, because we've already talked about the fact, and last week we looked at the fact that God is... Uh, Everywhere, he is all powerful. Uh, he is all knowing. Uh, he is all wise. He is all loving, um, and and all of these things. Very quickly, um, without looking at your notes from last week, you people who brought them. Uh, if it, if God is all knowing, he is said to be what? Omniscient. That's right. All right. Somebody other than Mason answer this one. If God is uh, all powerful, he is what? Okay. If God is everywhere, he is what? If God is um, perfectly loving, he is what? Omnibenevolent. And if God is all wise, he is what? Omnisapient. Omnisapient. That's right. And so um, we did talk about the, because we mentioned last week that God is all knowing and God is all wise, uh, when we look at the attribute of wisdom and knowledge, it's not exactly the same thing because here we're looking at the way in which God, through his wisdom and through his knowledge, interacts with us, his people. And so that's going to be the, uh, you know, the, the purpose of, of looking at this particular attribute because unlike being all-knowing, uh, unlike being all-wise and all-powerful, uh, we it, cap are capable of having knowledge. Uh, we are capable of being wise. Some of us more than others, uh, but it, it doesn't stop. It doesn't mean that, that we're not, uh, we don't possess wisdom of some kind. And so how are these attributes displayed as God interacts with us, his creation, us, his people? And so humanity displays uh, these attributes as part of the image of God that we all possess, whether we're believers or unbelievers. We're all going to possess this, uh, these attributes of knowledge and wisdom to some extent. But these attributes fail to reach the perfection of God due to the sinful part of our nature. And so while we can be wise and we can, while we can be knowledgeable, we cannot reach the all-knowing and all-wise uh, level that God is because we have this sinful nature and because God is the one who created us. And so we cannot be, we cannot be as the creation, we cannot be greater than the one who created us. And so each of these attributes will be displayed by people with varying degrees of capability and obedience. However, none are able to reach the perfect level in which God displays them. And so as we, we look at this, we are going to look at God as the giver of all knowledge and as the giver of all wisdom, not in the sense that he gives us all knowledge or all wisdom, but any, that we, we, any of this that we do possess, it is from God who gives it. All right. So there's the back, the sort of backdrop. Let's look at each one individually. We're going to start with knowledge. All right. So biblically, if we're there's a there's a whole lot of diff, different definitions of knowledge that can be out there. But biblically, knowledge covers a wide range of meanings, including intellectual understanding, personal experience, and personal relationships. And it is attributed to both God and humanity. Now the Bible claims that truth and knowledge originate exclusively from God and His revelation. So with that understanding, does this mean that we can possess any knowledge apart from God? Can, can we possess any knowledge apart from God? No. says no. Okay. I'm genuinely interested in this debate. Um, and so you have the, uh, the basic idea that if all of this emanates from God, then no, we can't, have, we can't have any knowledge apart from God because, like I said, all of it comes from Him. However, one answer to this question would be, um, do, do you have, do you personally have the knowledge of what it feels like to be guilty because you sinned? Anybody feel guilty because they've sinned before? Gil King, you better nod your head. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Does God have, does God know what it feels like to feel guilty because he sinned? See, this is an interesting question. And so uh, is, there, is there knowledge that we can have 
apart from God. Um, because obviously, the Lord has never sinned, and so, and if he did, I doubt that he would feel guilty about it because he is God. And so when you, when you think about it in that way, there is a, a case to be made that there's at least some knowledge that we possess separately from God. That being said, I would fall into the camp of no, just like Carla said, that there's, there's, there's no knowledge that we can possess apart from God because even, even the guilt that we feel when we have sinned, we only know that we have sinned because of the knowledge that God's given us. Uh, we only know that there is shamefulness in our disobedience and our sin because of the, the standard of morality that the Lord has set. And so even while he himself has never sinned, he himself has never felt guilty, that knowledge doesn't just pop up from nowhere. There's, there, is, there is some information, uh, there is some revelation that, that had to have been given at some point for us to ever have felt guilty, for us to have ever felt shame, for us to know that the, the, the things that we have done, that they're sinful. Uh, that they're, they're not just uh, our own creations, they're, they're given by God. And so uh, the Bible does claim and, and gives evidence to the fact that uh, all of our knowledge originates exclusively from God and nowhere else. Uh, knowledge can be divided into three parts. Uh, epistemology, and so this is the study of knowing, just how you, you get to this. Uh, epistemology of divine knowledge beginning with God. And so uh, where does God, God's knowledge come from? Does this knowledge exist independent of us? Exactly. It's 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 you know to to use a term from a couple of weeks ago. It's fully actualized potential. You know, so it, it, it comes from him. It emanates from him. It originates with him. Um, it does not. It, it does exist independent of us because it originates with God. And so, what does that mean for us? That if if God is the the source of divine knowledge, and there's uh, you know think back. Um, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago too. We asked the question of does God does God do the right thing because it's right, or is it the right thing because God does it? You know, this is this is this is an epistemological epistemological question of the origin of, of morality. Is does God do the right thing because it's right, or is it right because God does it? And after a little bit of discussion, uh, you know we rightly fell into the side of, you know, it's, it's right because God does it. He is the, he is the source. He is the, the beginning of all knowledge of wisdom, of morality. And so same goes for knowledge. It is, it is knowledgeable. And when we get to wisdom, it is wise because it originates with God. Second part of knowledge is the beginnings, the epistemology of human knowledge being given by God, but limited. So what does that mean? We, we're given knowledge by God, but limited. Our human frailty makes it smaller. Okay, that's that's true. Um, so you, you, I mean, we're getting ready to look at a, a couple of Bible verses where the, you know, just our understanding of everything, we 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 don't have that knowledge that God has because we don't have the capacity to have knowledge. So that's certainly part of it. What else does it mean that we have? Knowledge given by God, but it's limited. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know if you're if you are coming from a background uh, like a lot of us are, and like a lot of Westerners are, where you've got a problem, so what do you do? You pick yourself up by the bootstraps and you solve the problem, right? And so when you you understand that God has not given you all capability to solve every problem and all capability to uh, to think up every solution that we are still dependent on him that that really uh, that really comes up against our uh, western way of thinking sometimes because we we think of ourselves as so capable and nothing can stop us if uh, you you put your mind to it I was talking to a, a pastor today who uh, said that he he has a, a small they have one child and he's, he's very young but uh, they were saying that he purposely he catches himself sometimes but he purposely doesn't say to his his son you can be anything you want when you grow up 
because you can't, you know, I mean, we like to, we like to tell people that, but, um, you know, I'm sorry if, if your mother is 4'10 and you're 5'6", your kids are probably not going to be basketball players, you know, it's, they're not going to be professional basketball players. It's, it's just, it's not going to happen. I, I don't know what you said, Don, but you're wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's so you, 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 you think of, I don't know how tall his parents were, um, but uh, you, you, you think about we, we are limited because the Lord has not given us, you know, not even, not even to the level of all knowledge or all strength, but he hasn't even scratched the surface of all knowledge or all strength with what he's given us. But what he has given us and, and what is part of his character and, and his knowledge and his wisdom, what he has given us is the knowledge that we, we need to have, the knowledge of him, uh, the knowledge of how to please him, uh, even the knowledge of morality where, you know, outside of a, a religious or a spiritual context, the, the morality of how to treat other people. Uh, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that's, and, and within those two commandments are all the other commandments of the law and the prophets. And so we, we don't have all knowledge. We just scratch the surface, but we do have what we need. Uh, number three, theological pursuit. Uh, that categorizes knowledge as an intellectual discipline. And so in other words, knowledge is something that we can purposely try to grow in. And so while the Lord has given it, or excuse me, while the Lord is the originator, of all knowledge, and while the Lord has given us knowledge on a, a limited capacity, that does not mean that we cannot grow in our knowledge. He has also given us the, uh, the ability to, uh, to study, to learn, to disciple each other, to, to sharpen each other, and, and grow in our knowledge of Him. And so those are the three basic ways in which knowledge in a biblical sense is, is divided. God possesses first order knowledge, so this is the truth of all judgments. Uh, so this is uh, the the concrete what is right, and uh, He also uh, possesses second order knowledge. This is the truth of all judgments concerning His judgments, and so God knows the value of His judgments, the completely. But God also knows the results of His judgments, and God knows what you think about His judgments which is probably the most concerning part of it. And so you have, you have the biblical text, uh, you have the, the knowledge of God that has been given to us, and so the Lord can, can see, and we can even more clearly see, how obedient we are to that. But what's, what's deeper about that is the Lord knows how you feel about your obedience to that. And so, and, and again, it's not just... You know, part of probably one of the most difficult things about the Christian life is not living the Christian life. It is growing to love all aspects of the Christian life. And what I mean by that is allowing the, the knowledge of God and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to, to transform our minds into such a way that we not only understand the commands of God and what he's trying to, to get us to do, but our mind actually changes to love everything that he is, is trying to get us to do because our, our wanting us to, to do to be in fellowship with him. Because there's, it is much easier. It is not that difficult for me. In fact, I am, I am more comfortable. I always have been, even, even when I was a kid. It might be hard for you to believe, but even when I was a kid, I was more comfortable knowing what my boundaries were. You know, where, where I could, where was stepping outside the line, uh, what I could do, what I couldn't do, what were the rules of the game, what were the rules of the house or whatever. Maybe I was comfortable doing that, which is why it frustrated me so much when, when people went outside of those lines. And because I'm, 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 what was more difficult and what continues to be difficult for all of us in the Christian life is learning to, to love those borders, learning to, to love what actually has been delivered to us by, by God and, and, and his knowledge. And so... And that is our struggle. And as much as, as we try and be obedient and as obedient as we can be, it's not just about obedience. It's about learning to love the obedience and learning to love the knowledge that God has given us. And so that is our, our constant test within life. Any and all knowledge that we have originates with God first. This means that while God has knowledge that we do not have, there is no subject in which we have more knowledge than God. 
Again, the question of sin and guilt come to mind. Uh, what does this mean for us? Uh, how can God know what is sinful and how to punish? You know, this is, this is the basic answer to it. You know, how can God know what sin is and, and how to, to punish that sin justly without having knowledge of good and evil? Without having knowledge, even if not experiencing evil in a um, in a way in which he uh, participates in that, but but he can't judge righteously if he doesn't at least have the the knowledge of those things. And so this is this is why all knowledge originates with God, not outside of God, but uh, is delivered to us in such a way. All right, biblical evidence. Let's look at some Bible verses. Um, we think of knowledge. Uh, that, that the Lord gives as strictly being spiritual in nature. But if you look at Exodus chapter 31, there are these, these two guys that uh, the Lord is telling Moses and the people that God is going to fill with a specific type of knowledge to glorify him. And if you look at the context of this verse, it's specifically with the skill to build the tabernacle, to construct the tabernacle in such a way that it's obedient to him. And so... When we're thinking about the way in which God gifts us knowledge, it's not just the sense that he's going he's gonna to give us a, a great uh, ability to retain the information of the Bible. Uh, it's not that he's going to give us uh, the great ability to, you know, whether you've gone through uh, evangelism seminars and all this, this great abil ability to, to have the knowledge of of uh, the grace of God come to mind so you can evangelize effectively. You know, this is, is certainly going to be the case, but it's also all sorts of things that bring him glory. You know, this is why it's so special and why it is so important for us in all fields of work, in all fields of interest, when we have an opportunity to use those to bring glory to God. Because if all we're doing, you just think about the amount of time that you spend here in the church building uh, or even outside the church building doing church-sponsored ministries. If that's the totality of all that we're doing to honor God with our gifts and with our talents and with our knowledge, what a wasted life for the Lord. You know, all of us come from different professions. All of us have different backgrounds. We, we find ourselves in, in different places within our, our daily life. And I would like to think that we, we make our way there and we gravitate towards these things because the Lord has given us, has gifted us knowledge in certain specific areas. And so if, if this is true, how can we use this gift from God to bring glory to him, even if it's not teaching the Bible, even if it's not uh, you know, uh, nurturing children or whatever, you know, all of the different things that we, we do here. We, we, we find these different places, as Exodus 31 shows us, that God has gifted us to bring him glory in a very specific way. And, and that could be very different. It could be as a dentist. It could be as a fireman. It could be as a teacher. I mean, all sorts of, of, of different opportunities that we have that if we're not using this to bring God glory, what a, a wasted gift of knowledge uh, that God has given us. Uh, Job 21, this points to the omniscience of God. Who will teach God knowledge since he judges those who are on high? Um, sort of a, a humbling type of uh, verse. Psalm 2.5, understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This is different than uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We'll get to that here in a second. But because wisdom and knowledge are different. But uh, understanding that the fear of the Lord, if, if we're wanting to find knowledge, it starts with the fear of the Lord, just like if we want wisdom, it starts with the fear of the Lord. Uh, rejecting the Lord is the rejection of knowledge. Somebody look up and read for me 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. I didn't list this in this uh, particular section, but I think it goes along, along with this uh, verse from Proverbs. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Proverbs 1, 29 says, Rejecting the Lord is the rejection of knowledge. Raise your hand, clap your hands, yell at me when you get it. Somebody beat Gilda. Okay. You say you got it, Mason? Uh, well, I think I do. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Yes. You lose, Gilda. Stop. Turn, turn. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit. 
because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. Since it's evaluated spiritually. Some of your translations may have because it's spiritually discerned. And so Proverbs chapter 1, rejection of the Lord actually leads to the rejection of knowledge. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us some things people won't understand. Why will they not understand it? Well, Paul says because it's spiritually discerned. Proverbs chapter 1 would say because they've rejected the Lord. And so they, they can't have the full knowledge and the full understanding of, of what's going on around them, whether that's spiritually, whether that's you know politically, uh, ideologically, you know, just in, within the community with people, whatever it may be. If we are created by God and we're made in the image of God and we really want to understand this life, rejecting God is rejecting part of the knowledge that's going to help us to understand this life. And so it's not just Proverbs uh, chapter 1, it's also uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Carla? But doesn't Satan also teach? Uh, you know, influence, is that what you're... Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. And so um, you look in, in uh, the book of James, for instance... Um, uh, um, oh, what does it say? Uh, reject, reject the devil, and he'll flee from you, or so. And so it's you know, and and here in, I think it's James chapter one. Also, I believe tells us, uh, you know, we are um, we we end up committing sin that leads to death when we're lured and enticed by our own desires. And so I, I think it's important to to understand that. One, Satan has limited power. Uh, he, is, he is limited in what he can do, not because he, he can't physically do it, but he is, he is limited in the, what God will allow him to do. And so when you're, you're looking at spiritual warfare and you're looking at influences, I, I think it certainly is something to be, to be well aware of. But at the same time, if we are, it's impossible for us, and you can, you can think of it like this, it's impossible for us to be to be lured and enticed in such a way that we are moving towards the influence of Satan if we're pursuing God, because there are two opposite extremes. And so, as, as we are, as we are, you know, just to use the language of, of Proverbs chapter one. If instead of rejecting the Lord and rejecting knowledge, if we are pursuing the Lord and pursuing knowledge, that's that's naturally going to take us in a direction that's away from the influence of Satan. Well, at the same time, if we are rejecting the Lord and rejecting knowledge, that's going to naturally put us in a, in a course that we are allowing ourselves to be influenced by uh, the work of Satan. And so, um, it, you know, I, I think that you're, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. It's, it's understanding we are, we are created to worship and we're going to worship something. If we're not pursuing God and we're worshiping that, then we're going to find something else and, that's where spiritual warfare takes a, you know, because we are so, especially people my age, because we're not that smart. You know, we are, we are so influenced by Hollywood and these sorts of things. And so we think of spiritual warfare as these movies about, you know, if, if, if you're not going through demonic possession, then you're not going through spiritual warfare, which is absolutely not true. You know, the, the, the most subtle types of spiritual warfare are the ones that pull the most people in. It's not the... It's not the overt type of, of, you know, snatching up somebody's family or whatever it may be. It's influencing, hey, you know what, this, this is sinful in the eyes of God. It's very clear in the Bible. You were taught better than this. But you know what? You're smarter than your parents, and you're smarter than that pastor, and you're smarter than your Sunday school teachers. They're just part of a backwards generation. And so why don't you just pursue what, what brings you pleasure and makes you happy? That's absolutely an aspect of spiritual warfare. It's uh, being very, very careful with that as well. Uh, Malachi chapter 2. Uh, this is God's covenant with Levi. Um, and it says that God's covenant was to, with Levi was to guard knowledge, not to neglect it. And here in Malachi, he's actually slapping down the people of Israel a little bit. You can look at that some. But the, the Levites, if you remember back, were the priestly tribe. Uh, uh, a lot of things separated with them. And so, for instance... Um, they did not have to serve in the military, so the Levites did not have to fight. Um, they were responsible for performance of uh, services, ceremonies. Uh, they were religious functionaries, these, these sorts of things. Um, 
uh, on the down, they also did not get to inherit land uh, when they went into the, the promised land. Joseph's family got a double portion because the Levites had none. But, you know, their, their covenant with God, Levi's covenant with God with his descendants were not just to, you know, prepare the sacrifices and to prepare the tabernacle and the temple later on and make a nice place for people to worship. You're to protect knowledge. You're to protect the, uh, the, the commands of God and make sure the people understand them. And obviously they didn't because Malachi chapter 2, they're, they're getting smacked down for it because they neglected to protect knowledge, not to, to guard it as something that's, that's cherished. And, uh, you know, for, for us, we have to be very careful not to, not to taint the knowledge of God and, and to, to scar it in some way with our own personal beliefs about things because that's, that's again, that's not pursuing uh, true knowledge, and that's not pursuing the way of God. Uh, Luke, let's see. Uh, Luke 11, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Uh, praise God. Uh, you know, any passage against lawyers, we're happy with. Um, <laughs> Romans chapter 10, uh, passion for God does not equal saving knowledge of God. Uh, you know, lots of people worship their idea of what God is rather than actually worshiping God. And so this is telling us passion for God is not the same thing as knowledge of God. Be very careful. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, um, there's a prayer that love may abound with knowledge and discernment. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, God's transforming power when we trust in him and giving us uh, more knowledge. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, those con who continually learn but never arrive at true knowledge. Uh, you know, I would... I would throw people like Sam Harris and, and other militant atheists into this uh, category because constantly trying to learn, constantly trying to, to improve scholastically, but have no real knowledge because they don't have knowledge of God. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, you have been anointed by the Holy Spirit and possess knowledge. And so again, just the, the gift that it is. God does not just, just take his, his omniscience, all of his knowledge, and keep it, but he gives some of it. In a limited way, he gives some of it to us and so that's knowledge what is wisdom what's the difference here uh, so wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge in practical ways uh, when you think about it in terms of God's wisdom it is the ability to use this knowledge or his knowledge in ways that accomplish his will and so the knowledge that we have can be used to destructive ends we can we can know things and I'm not just talking about you know, Exodus 31, physical, practical, even spiritual things. We can know things that are used to destructive ends. And so how do we, how do we make sure not to do that? Uh, you know, you think about the, the um, nativity story. Uh, wise men from the east are coming, and they have this knowledge, uh, and they're following the star, and they're, they're going to worship the king. So they go to Herod, and Herod calls in all his smart people. And they say, he says, where is this supposed to happen? You know, and they tell him, well, we've looked in the, we've looked in the records, and we've looked in the prophecies, and we've looked in the, the scripture in Bethlehem. And so they got the knowledge, but they don't have the wisdom as to, to what to do with that. You know, they, they don't have the, the concept of this is going to happen, so we need to go and worship. And said, so they're like, this is going to happen, so when it happens, tell us so that we can go execute this baby you know that's that is it's 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 using the knowledge that we possess or in god's instance the knowledge that he has is all knowing perfect knowledge and using it in a way that accomplishes his will the perfect way to accomplish his will and so throughout history wisdom has been identified by philosophers and theologians as the pursuit of truth wisdom itself can be thought of as the correct application of knowledge even if someone possesses perfect knowledge, they may not be able to apply that knowledge productively. And so this exists in the world. This exists in the church. Um, and I'll just say this, uh, you know, because we're going to get to this in a second. But the difference between knowledge and wisdom is wisdom is what kind of gift? There is a, there is a specific kind of gift in which wisdom is. You, you know it. You just don't know what I'm asking. It's a spiritual gift. Yes, thank you, Mason. Uh, Mason's on her A game tonight. Um, so uh, it's a, it is one of the spiritual gifts. So we can, we can be gifted wisdom by God, 
But the difference between a, a gift or a talent that the Lord gives and a spiritual gift is a spiritual gift is, is, is strictly within the church. It's used to edify and build up the church. This is a spiritual gift. And so it has been my experience, and this is a lancism, and so I'll, I'll try and tell you when it's a lancism and when it's, actually, you know, it's doctrinally sound. But this is a lancism. It's been my experience that the people who I think have the spiritual gift of wisdom are probably some of the most humble people I've ever met. You know, if, if you think you have the spiritual gift of wisdom, you probably don't. Um, as, and, and, you know, if you, if you go through these, uh, sometimes you'll go through these spiritual gift inventories, and if it pops up, you have the gift of wisdom, and your reaction is, <laughs> of course I do, uh, versus, you know, versus, well, this can't be right. I need to take this again. I, I, this is not what I was expecting. That it's, it's, you know, we can become very puffed up uh, with pride and vanity and all sorts of things with the, the gifts that the Lord gives us. It has nothing to do with us. It's, it's, it's given to us to, for, for his glory. And so I, here again, in my experience, people who have the gift of wisdom are very, uh, very humble people. Uh, the biblical foundation of God's wisdom is that he is called wise, uh, delivers wise words, makes wise decisions, performs wise actions, and is himself the source of all wisdom. So to some extent, wisdom is empirical. Okay? Write that down. To some extent, wisdom is empirical. That means, to some extent, you can see it. it it's, it's not just, it is something that is, it is evidenced by uh, actions, results, consequences, this, this sort of thing. Much in the same way that in the Old Testament, uh, the test for a false prophet was simple. If they say something that comes from the Lord and it doesn't happen, they're a false prophet, period. There is no second chance. Uh, and so with, with wisdom, it, there, there, is a, there is an empirical way of, of looking at, at the results of your words, actions, uh, decisions, and, and realizing whether or not that's, that's wisdom. Now, I said to some extent, because even people who are talented, even people who are gifted, even people who are spiritually gifted are still people, and therefore they're what? Sinful, imperfect, yeah. Insert whatever word you want to here, absolutely. And so to, to some extent, it's, it's evidence-based, but not completely. And so unlike the false prophet, uh, if, if you do have the gift of wisdom and you mess up, that does not mean the Lord has taken away uh, your gift of wisdom and you're going to try everything, grow your hair out like Samson, do whatever you have to to get this back. No, that's not what it means. It just means we're imperfect. And, and you know, we need to humble ourselves and, and ask the Lord's forgiveness and, and ask for his strength to, to, to go forward and, and make a, a, a more wise decision next time. And so, but at the same time, as we on the outside who don't have the spiritual gift of wisdom, and I do not have the spiritual gift of wisdom, I'm far too arrogant for that. Um, but it's it's important for us looking at these people not to to judge them in such a way that they made a mistake. Maybe we need to not give them such uh, responsibility in the future. We're all imperfect. We're all sinful. We all, you know, we all. If the Lord thinks that we were worth a second chance then we should certainly think that, that others are worth a second chance. So, were you raising your hand or you're stretching, Hunter? Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> This is like an auction. All right, don't be giving any of these because um, I'm going to call on you. All right. So, uh, God's wisdom is the ability to achieve perfect ends by perfect means. And for us to be considered wise, it means that our, and that's supposed to be our ends, and means have to be worthy of God. Uh, this is one of the responses to the problem of evil. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, why, if God is so powerful and in control of everything, then he allows such terrible things uh, to happen? Well, you don't have all wisdom. Uh, you, you, like we were talking last week, you see things in a linear timeline. The Lord doesn't, is not constrained by those things. Uh, the Lord has wisdom that you do not. Uh, the Lord has wisdom that is outside of, of what has already happened. The Lord has wisdom that exists in the future. The Lord has knowledge that exists in the future. And so because we, uh, we cannot achieve perfect ends by perfect means, we can't possibly judge the way in which the Lord chooses 
to interact in his way with his means to his ends because he has he has all knowledge wisdom is better known by acquaintance than by definition and therefore to understand wisdom we look to the one who is wise which is god and so it is uh true or not true it is easier to learn how to do a task when you have a good teacher showing you how to do it versus trying to figure it out on your own. True or not true? True, yes. Um, maybe not if you have bad teachers, that's why I had to add the qualifier. Um, I used to teach teenagers, so I'm very, I'm very, very careful with my words. But, uh, and so when we, when we are trying to discern what is wise and what is a wise decision, the best place for our, us to look is the one who has the most wisdom that we can possibly learn from. And in our case, that is God. And, and thankfully, you know, it is not just a, a history of oral tradition the way it used to be and, and passed down. We, we, have a, we have a written tradition. We have words that we can look at. We have words that we can study. We have things that we can go to day after day, night after night if we want to, and try and, and think about, oh, well, you know, this, this situation wasn't in the Bible, but how would the Lord want me to handle this? And you can look through the text. You can look through the Proverbs, and you look through uh, Ecclesiastes and, and some of these other places, that the wisdom literature that, that teaches us what is, what is wise in God's eyes, what is, what is the, the, the best way to discern situation from, from situation to situation. And so as we, as we think about gaining wisdom, we look to the one who is wise. Wisdom belongs to God. Therefore, any wise application must be the foundation of God. Can a non-believer, this is another one of those questions I'm genuinely, genuinely interested in the, the debate. So can a non-believer do anything good? How many say yes? Raise your hand. How many say no? Raise your hand. <laughs> See, this isn't fair. All right. Because I said, how many said yes, raise your hand? About half of you raise your hand. When I said, how many say no? Nobody raises their hand. It's like, oh, that's too many. You know, I'm not going to go up against this. So let's try this one more time. Have confidence. You don't know what I'm going to say. All right. So how many of you, how many of you think the non-believer can do good things? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> how many of you believe a non-believer can't do good things? Raise your hand. Give me somebody. Thank you, Mike Shelton. Thank you so much. You're a brave man, sir. Um, yeah, well, that's, yeah, well, now you're just, now, see, just, you should have just stopped when I complimented you, but, um, so, this is, this is the reason why this is such a, it, it sort of goes back to the, to the same problem, because one, can a, can a non-believer do anything that's good? One, the answer would be no, because God is the foundation of all wisdom and goodness, so if they don't have God, if they're not pursuing God, how can they do anything that's good? Because even if they even if they happen to fall into it. You know, we just accidentally do something righteous. We accidentally do something good. Is that, actually, is that genuine because they weren't trying to? You know, the, the motive wasn't there. Uh, on the other hand, the answer is yes, because wisdom is to some extent empirically based. And so even with the wrong motives, God is going to work, you know, in spite of that person, if not through that person. And so... Again, it's, it's kind of a, it's debatable, um, and, and it's something that we, we have to look at with the, the understanding of, you know, God is the foundation of all wisdom. So if we are going to, if we are not going to fall into it by accident, but if our motive is to do something righteous and good and pure and wise, then we need to be pursuing God first and, and not just praying that we, praying that we fall into it. Uh, what I'm going to do, let's just, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to open it up for some questions or comments, and we'll just quickly run through the biblical evidence uh, at the beginning of, of next week. So, uh, questions or comments? I, there are some things that we can we can understand about the commands of God, and they're they're easily we, we grasp them very easily and we love them easily. And so, for instance, um, the idea of 
uh, God giving us community to help us out. Uh, you know, God giving us the church, God giving us family. These are two of the things that he instituted. Uh, and you are, we're to be a part of this. We're to be a part of a family. We're to be a part of a church. We're to be a part of a, uh, a group that cares for each other. We can get that. We, we love that. We want to buy into that and be a part of it. Um, there are other things such as, uh, you know, uh, to, be, to be generous rather than greedy. Um, that comes a little bit more difficult to some people. I, they, I, I would rather, you know, sometimes you would rather hold on to your money. Um, I, I heard this story one time about this. Uh, hey, this was actually a pastor too, and he was talking about he and his wife. They didn't like going into debt for anything, and so they were saving up to to buy brand new hardwood floors for their house. Okay, and so they were they've been doing this for months, just saving money trying to, to get to this point. And at, and about the time they were ready to buy them, once somebody in his family had a had a big medical expense that they that they needed and, and it was going to be really difficult on them. and they didn't give them all the money but they did give them some of the money that they had saved and he's he he said to himself he felt guilty because his initial reaction was how can i help without giving them what we had saved for our floors and he he initially you know he said i almost was disobedient to god and i was almost unloving to my family for floors and we, we put it in that context, and it, it just shows us that, that, you know, even when we do it, we don't always love doing it in the way that God loves generosity and God loves grace. Um, you know, I try and be gracious with everybody. There are some people that I, it's much easier for me to be gracious with than others. And so, I mean, it's just the truth. Uh, and so that's, that's what I mean by not only being obedient, but learning to love obedience and learning to love the Christian life because it's, it's not it's not easy with everything the way it is with some things does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah so. that was yeah my point that because we're sinners imperfect yeah even the good we genuinely want to do is taken from the sin. yeah there's a there's a story and I, I go over this sometimes with my students because there's this Within ethics, there's this belief that uh, altruism doesn't exist. And so the, the idea of, of doing something just out of the goodness of your heart, there's this idea that it doesn't exist. And so, for instance, um, why do you, if somebody, if, you're, if you see somebody on the street and they, you know, trip and fall and knock all their stuff over or whatever, uh, you know, and you feel like, man, I need to, to, to go help them. And so you go help them. Uh, does nothing for you. They don't give you a reward. They, you know, you just, is, is that out of the goodness of your heart? Or is that because two hours later, you're going to feel guilty about it? And, and so you do it just so you won't feel guilty about it later, which is still selfish in motive. You, you see what I'm saying? And so, so you, would, you would fall into the category of there's, maybe there's altruism, but there's nothing spiritually on our own. It takes the, it just, it takes the Lord. Do it first. Right. You know, we do good, but it's just on a human level. Yeah. It doesn't compare with the goodness of Absolutely. And yeah. What you were saying about altruism and all that, our motives. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever read Maya Rand's yeah. books, she was an atheist. Yeah. Course. She had a lot to say about that. Yeah. Well, that's. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. With, with, she's a big one within philosophy for sure. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Got a challenge for you. Let's have next week, let's have a group just this big uh, for, for next week's uh, lesson as well. And so I hope you, hope you guys will come back. Uh, just very quickly, if you're interested, um, I've got the first four lessons. I've got copies of them over here. I don't have enough for everyone. So you guys who've been here all summer, I hope you, hopefully you kept yours. But um, if this is your first week and you would like uh, some copies of the other notes from the, the first uh, first four weeks. Just let me know. But let me pray for us and we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Uh, Lord, just thank you for the opportunity to, to be here tonight and to, to fellowship together, have some fun, but also to, to learn about you, uh, to grow in you, uh, to use the knowledge and the wisdom that you have given us to bring you honor and glory, not to, to take it in, in any selfish way for ourselves, but to give it entirely back to you. Uh, let this be our goal. Let this be our prayer. In Jesus' name. 
Amen.